Father, we are grateful this morning, Lord, that you are God, that your character is perfect. Lord, that you have loved us with a perfect love. Lord, that you created us and breathed into us the breath of life. And Lord, even though we fell and Lord walked away from you, God, in your love and your compassion, you sent your son, Lord, to redeem us from every sin, to bear the consequence of our sin. And, and God, we know that heaven will be filled with praise that is eternal because you are our creator and our redeemer. And Lord, we stand before you today, Lord, just recognizing who you are and Lord, asking that you would help us to love you more, to trust you more. And we praise you and we pray that you'd pour out your spirit in this place in Jesus name. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, worship team. As always, just a tremendous uh, pleasure and joy to be led by all of you. Amen? Amen. God is good. And uh, just pray that uh, today as you worship with us, that you will sense God speak into your heart and your life and, and that you'll uh, hear a word of encouragement from from our Father, through His Spirit, through the message of Christ, and, and that you would go from this place knowing that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, again, I want to welcome you here, and especially all our guests. We just pray that you are blessed, and I and, uh, want to, I don't know if Pastor Kurt mentioned this, but we do have birthday cake today. We missed it last week, and we weren't going to deny January birthdays, plus I wanted a piece of cake. Truth be told, confession. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to be back. And uh, it's good to be in God's house. And just to recognize, um, without preaching a sermon on it, it's good to recognize the seventh day Sabbath. Amen? Because in it, we're, we're recognizing that God is creator, right? Genesis chapter 2, God finished his work and he rested and he blessed and he sanctified the seventh day. And... Uh, you know, we do it uh, in honor of him that, that he did that, and, and it's a blessing to be part of that um, and just to recognize God as creator. You know, we never lose that aspect of God, right? We often think of God as redeemer in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should. But Revelation, the book of Revelation, is filled with this idea of worshiping God because why? Because he's creator, right? We never lose that aspect of God uh, and his... Uh, who he is, who he is, creator, redeemer, the lover of our soul, the one who renews us uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. God has the Holy Spirit for his people, amen? amen. And uh, that hasn't changed, and I'm so thankful that God has poured out his spirit here this morning already. New beginnings. Do you need a new beginning? Do you need a fresh start? Maybe you lost a a job, I was thinking about, you know, context of fresh starts. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you need a new job. Maybe you've made a lot of bad decisions, right? And you have put yourself in a position where you need a fresh start. That seems like that's uh, often the case in life, that, that we make a bad decision or two and we need a, a fresh start, a new beginning. Well, praise the Lord that we serve a God of new beginnings, Right? If there's a theme in the Bible, it's about new beginnings, right? God is a restorer. God is the one who renews and, and makes all things new. Think about the things that are promised, that God has promised to us a new heavens, right, and a new earth. Because why? Because this has been corrupted, and we need it to be made new. We think of God and Jesus, Jesus as he, as before he goes to the cross, he says, here's a new covenant, right, in my blood. We think that God, we realize that God has made a new covenant because the old covenant, uh, there was something wrong with it in the sense that there was something wrong with people, right? Is that we couldn't uphold our end of the bargain. And so God comes in the person of his son and he makes a new covenant in his blood that he might save us and that he promises us that he will wipe away all of our sins, forgive us, 
and that he will write his laws on our hearts and pour out his spirit within us. New covenant. God gives us a new spirit within us, right? As we come to Christ, the Lord renews the Holy Spirit, restores the Holy Spirit in our hearts, right? And we have a new spirit, the the word of God talks about. Even in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It's no longer business as usual, right, when you're saved. It's no longer just, hey, it's my agenda, it's my way. But now the spirit of God is within you, convicting you and saying, you know what, you need to walk in a different path, right? That's the new spirit that God has given us, his Holy Spirit. And he's transforming us into the same image. And, of course, we think of Revelation 21.5 21.5 that says, Behold, I make all things new. We serve a God who makes all things new. He's the God of new. He's the God of restoration. So it doesn't matter your crisis or your pit. You serve a God who makes all things new. The text I want to focus on is found in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It'll be in front of you. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are in Christ a new creation. Right? When you think of new, what do you think of? Well, there's some things, there's some words that should come into our mind when we think of that we are new creations in Christ. Christ. Well, we're forgiven, right? That no longer do our sins account against us, but we stand righteous and holy before God. We're new in that sense, right? Forgiven. We're also washed, similar idea. We are reconciled to a holy God. Once our relationship was was, uh, broken, but now we're new. We're new creations, and these creations that God has made us to be is our creations that are reconciled to a holy God. So we're forgiven, we're reconciled, we're filled, right? I love this next word, translated, right? What does it mean to be a new creation? It means that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It means that we have been translated from outside of the family of God, translated into the family of God, adopted as sons, right? Adopted so much in this new identity that we have in Christ. All things are new. We belong to a new kingdom, a new family. We have new identity in Christ. Who am I? Who are you in Christ Jesus? Right? Well, we're sons of the living God. We're citizens of his kingdom. I love that verse in in Hebrews that talks about that we're members of that general assembly, right, of the Lamb written in heaven. We're members of that general assembly, that spiritual assembly of all saved people that God has redeemed. We have a new value system in Christ, don't we? How are things new? We have a new value system. Things are different. What's important now is different than what was important before I was saved, before I was new, before I was translated into the kingdom of God. How should I live? What do I value? Right? Now in Christ, we, we value that golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's no longer me first, but it's others first. It's others first. We have a new direction in Christ. What is your direction as you live in Christ Jesus? It's to please him, isn't it? It's to serve him. It's to follow his Uh, calling and work in our life. It's a life that is aimed to please him, to be used of God, right? To bring him glory and to love him forever. That's our direction in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Your destiny is different, right? Apart from Christ, we're destined for death, eternal death. In Christ, we're destined for life, eternal life. What is your destiny in Christ as you walk with him? Is it not life and blessing and goodness and love? Amen. 
That's our destiny. When the Bible talks about that we're new creations, right, it really means we're new creations. Our identity has changed. Our purpose has changed. Our direction has changed. Our value system has changed. Our hope has changed. We've been given a hope, right? I really don't know how people live life with no hope, right? To think that this is just it. If I get 90 years or 100 years, some get much less than that. I don't know how people do that, but in Christ, we've been given a hope of eternal life, of being resurrected from the dead, even as Christ our Lord was resurrected. And we see that the power of his resurrection borne out in the lives of changed people who were new creations in Christ. From disciples who were fearful to disciples who, as they said, turned the world upside down, right? We've been given a hope because Christ has raised, been raised from the dead. There's a quandary, though, and I think it's important to recognize there's a difficulty for the Christian. And the difficulty is that sometimes things don't feel very new, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? I read in the word that all things are new, old things have passed away, but sometimes I don't feel very new, right? I'm still struggling with that bad attitude. I'm still struggling with my flesh. I'm still saying things that I shouldn't be saying, right? Nobody ever struggles with that. It's true. But you know, even though the feeling isn't there a lot of times, even though the struggle is there. Hear what God is saying. God is saying all things are new, right? You are a new creation. That's what God is saying. You know, I thought of uh, this example of, of a man who had made preparation to travel to the South Pole. You know, he'd done all the things that, that you would imagine um, that you would do to prepare for such a journey. But then as he's halfway there, he decides in that moment that he's going to turn back. He's no longer going to go to the South Pole. And isn't it true that in that moment that he makes that decision, even though he's only one step away where he just was, or maybe not even a step away, isn't it true that everything has changed for that man? Everything has changed. His whole direction is new, right? Obviously, he's going 180 degree differently. His attitude is new. No longer is he pursuing uh, the, the South Pole, but he's going back home. His goals are new. His perspective is new. His destination is new. And I think likewise in the Christian life that we can say uh, that even though things sometimes seem so much the same, in the eyes of God and in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual reality that we live in, they are radically different. If you are a Christian, God says all things are new. But again, the reality is you may not feel like it. And the reality is sometimes you may not even live like it. But isn't this the truth that that our feelings don't ultimately determine or define our faith? Can you say amen to that? If they did, we'd all be in trouble, right? If our feelings ultimately were in control of our faith or ultimately defined our faith, because isn't it true that faith is something different than feelings? Think of this. I wonder how Christ felt as he walked, as you've heard in the song, the Via Dolorosa, the path to the cross. I wonder how he felt. I wonder if he felt like he wanted to do that. I wonder if he felt like he was the savior of the world. I wonder if when Jesus was bleeding and suffering and wearing that crown and being mocked on, uh, mocked and spit on, I wonder if he felt like the savior. But it was his faith, right, that propelled him forward. His faith was deeper than his feelings, I can't imagine feeling like the Savior in that circumstance. 
but his faith propelled him. You know, as we begin a, a, a new year, oftentimes we, we think about new beginnings, and I think that's appropriate. And again, I want to ask you today, do you need a new beginning, a fresh start, a new direction? Maybe that will mean to break off an old direction. Do you need to be reminded that you are indeed new, that you are a new creation? I want to talk uh, today about recapturing the reality of our newness that we have in Jesus Christ, of letting the truth of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that we just read sink into our hearts as we begin this new year and let it move you, let it inspire you, let it be the catalyst that will transform every part of our life, right? Because that's what God is after. God is after the complete transformation of us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And it's a process, it's a journey. I want to do this by considering Saul, um, that man that was trapped. And the Saul I'm referring to is not King Saul of the Old Testament, but Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament. That Saul of Tarsus that later became Paul, right? That we're so familiar with, the, the, the Paul, the apostle, right? Paul, the servant of the Lord. Paul that wrote much of uh, the New Testament that we read today. The Paul who preached to thousands and thousands in his day. And the neat thing about thinking about the life of Paul is that he's preached to millions since, right? Not only through the New Testament, but through the disciples that came in his wake. Have you ever wondered, you know, where, how, how, how have I become a disciple? Who do you trace back to, right? We, we, we trace our ancestry, and I came from such and such. But each of us come from, some, from a disciple, right? Essentially, from Christ. Someone told the story. Someone told the story to another person, and so on down the line until someone told the story to us, Right? But before he was Paul, this man that was greatly used of God and is still being greatly used through his work, he was Saul. Saul was a trapped man, a desperate man. Saul was a conflicted man. Saul was an angry man. And no doubt, Saul was a confused man. Because when he was Saul as we talked about in class today, he thought he was doing everything right. That was his own confession. But I believe the more he did the right thing, put quotes around that, the more his life seemed to be spinning out of control. In his story, you know it well, I'm sure, it was those followers of Jesus that were driving him crazy. They lived contrary to his belief system, and they were truly a problem for him. But the more he persecuted them, the more their message spread. Paul, later in life, in a moment of transparency, he wrote and described the way he felt during this time of his life. And we read it in Acts 26, 11. He says, I punish them, meaning Christians, often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That's, 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 Saul's, that's Paul's words of his life as Saul. You know, just get, get, feel the weight of these words, right? He punished them. He beat them. He, he would scourge them. He would work for their death. That was Saul. That was him. He would compel them to blaspheme. He would get in their faces and he would yell, I'm sure, and scream. And he would say, you will renounce Jesus. He is not the Messiah. That was the life of Saul. He would compel them to deny their faith. How would you stand up, right? Right? Somebody with the weight of Saul and the authority of Saul, how would you wait? Uh, uh, how would you stand up under that weight? 
to deny your faith, to deny Jesus that he's not the Messiah. That was the life of Saul. He says he was exceedingly enraged. He was, he was like a madman, right? As, as one commentator uh, puts it, with the fury and violence of a maniac. He persecuted them to foreign cities. And in other words, outside of, outside of that geographical region that, was, that I understand was given to Abraham and his descendants, he went out of that. He went to Damascus and to Syria, and he would track them down. He would go into the synagogues, and he would look for them, and he would try to find them. That's his words. Luke, of course, a companion of Paul, writes in the book of Acts, also describing this man's Paul as Saul before he was changed. Look at Acts 9.1. Uh, Luke writes, Saul, still breathing threats and murder out against, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. That word breathing out is an interesting word, isn't it? I want to just read this little snippet of of someone's description of this word breathing. Because I think it's easy to read over it and just to go on and not capture uh, what's being said. It's expressive often of any deep agitation, agitating emotion. Think about that. Think about your own breathing in in certain circumstances. You know, you you get excited, you get worked up. It's expressive often of any deep agitating emotion as as, we, as uh, we then breathe rapidly and violently. It is thus expressive of violent anger. The emotion is absorbing, it's agitating, it's exhausting, and it demands a more rapid circulation of blood to supply the exhausted vitality. I think that's well said. He was breathing out violence. He was, he was worked up. Threats and murder were on his mind and heart. He was bloodthirsty. And it's well noted that he was bloodthirsty against the disciples of who? Of the Lord, Jesus. Not against wicked men. Not against murderers and thieves, right? But against the innocent followers of Jesus Christ. That's where he was, this Saul. Praise God for the grace of God. Amen? The grace of God. It's important to realize that this Saul of Tarsus was a gifted man. He was an educated man. We know uh, the story well. He was a man of zeal. He was a man of purpose. I would say, and I think you would agree with me, those are good qualities. Those are great qualities. But, right, apart from Christ... They left him an empty man. His life was missing something, and he knew it, I believe. And as much as he tried to fill the void by destroying others, it just wasn't working. It's ironic, isn't it, that in the context of doing everything right, in his mind, in his religious understanding, something was terribly wrong. Of course, he thought he did God a service, but he was mistaken. So we can say this, that Saul of Tarsus, he needed a new beginning, right? He needed a fresh start. And he got, he got one, right? Right? What may be one of the most uh, dramatic conversion experiences of, of all history. Um, just a tremendous conversion. And it all began when he encountered, right, the living Lord of glory. Right? Amen? That's when he got his radical transformation, when he encountered Jesus, the resurrected Lord. And it's interesting, we, we have several accounts of his conversion in Acts, um, and I want to read uh, just a few verses in Acts 26, 9 through 18. It'll be in front of you. It's a, it'll be a little small to read, so you might want to open your Bible. But this is, this is his defense, his, uh, his recounting of his life and mission before King Agrippa as he was being brought up on charges before the secular courts at this time. 
To make a long story short, he says this, I thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's where his mind was. Many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen, had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes. And if you don't have this verse under, underlined in your Bible, you need to. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Great passage. What do we see here that led to Saul's amazing transformation, his conversion, his new beginning. And of course, uh, many points could be made. I want to make two, two realities, two principles. Number one, he encountered the light. Okay? Look again, verse 13. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. You know, one thing that's true as, as you study the scriptures that you realize is that God uses natural things to teach us spiritual things, right? And when we see that this light engulfed and surrounded Saul, it gives us a, a spiritual picture <clears throat> of what was happening. That the light as it surrounded Paul, Saul, was a picture of truth getting a hold of Saul, the truth. The light. Light represents truth, doesn't it? Your word, the psalmist writes, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Light represents truth. Saul was, uh, had an un unmistakable encounter with truth. What was it? We read it. We read it. Here's part of it. The one phrase that I want to stick out in your mind. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, I don't know how your translation uh, translates that, but goads were, uh, was, a, was any object that had a sh sharp point on it, which was designed to pierce if necessary, but it was meant to guide animals in the right direction, right? To poke them if they got out of line. What was Jesus saying? To kick against the goads. Jesus was saying to, to Saul that he was rebelling against God. Against authority. To kick against the goads would mean getting into greater difficulty, right? Right? It would be to get into greater difficulty by attempting to oppose the commands of duty, as, as one person put it. If you're a farmer, I'm sure you know that some animals don't receive correction very well. Some animals are a little more stubborn. Paul, Saul was like that. It begs the question, how do we kick against the goads? 
What does it look like to kick against the goads? Have you been there? God's trying to guide you a certain direction and you're fighting against his guiding? That was the truth that Saul needed to hear. Saul, it's hard to kick against the goads. What's it look like? Here's one commentary that gives insight. We kick against the goads goads when we violate the plain laws of God, when we resist his claims, when we refuse to follow conscience. It is when you attempt to free yourself from serious impressions and alarms. Kicking against the the goads is pursuing a course of vice and wickedness against what you know to be right. It is refusing to submit to the dealings of providence or God. And finally, it's any way opposing God and refusing to submit to his authority and to do what is right. That's where Saul was. That's what Jesus was telling Saul. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. In Saul's case, he was clinging to the past. He was refusing to see what the new thing that God was doing. And in in, in attempting to do it his own way, he was running over his conscience. I think about this a lot. You know, the Bible talks about he was there at Stephen's death. And, and uh, Stephen, of course, the first martyr in the New Testament, saved Christ, obviously. Um, I think about the witness and the testimony that, that must have been in, to, to directed towards Saul as he, as he angrily and, and violently compelled people to blaspheme and, and to see these Christians in, in faith, in in sincerity, in love, in, in this, this unmistakable connection with God. Yet he was in their face. I think that his conscience was being run over as he insisted that they blaspheme, as he punished the innocent, the sincere, as he was exceedingly enraged, as he persecuted. He was kicking against the goads. That's the truth that Saul needed to hear. It's not working, Saul. Consider what you are doing, right? Isn't it true that new directions require an encounter with the truth? Because you'll never begin again until you come to the truth that what you have been doing isn't working. You must encounter the truth because new beginnings require a break from old paths. And I think it's true that we could say that if we're going to break from old paths, we've got to realize the bankruptcy or the failure of those old paths. And God, no doubt, had mercy on Saul. And isn't it beautiful that it was through a tragic circumstance, right? Sometimes we we shake our head and we don't understand what God is doing, but it was through a tragic circumstance and and Saul was blind for three days. He had to be led around, taken to Damascus by guide. But it was through this circumstance that God was giving Saul an opportunity to reflect, to take a hard look at what he was doing. We could say it like this. Jesus gave Saul a moment for self-examination. Something spiritual was going on in the life of Saul, and it was he was encountering the truth. It was a wake-up call. And, of course, we all need that from time to time. God uses different things. God allows different things in our life. Maybe an illness, a financial crisis, a relational crisis, maybe a national crisis, right? Of course, those are not the truth truth themselves, are they? They are only uh, the means by which God provides for us to have an encounter with the truth. When when we go through trials and difficulties, we should reflect. We should take a moment. There's an important point made 
in all of this that, that when Jesus gave Saul an encounter with the truth, it was not to condemn Saul, right? Had nothing about condemning him, but it was opening up a door for a new opportunity, for a new beginning, for a fresh start. That's the beauty of the truth of God. It's not there to condemn. It's there to empower you, right? For new direction, for new life. That's the God we serve. Here's reality number two in what were catalysts to Saul's new beginning. He encountered the truth. He encountered the truth of his situation. And he encountered the truth, Jesus Christ. Right? If we want a new beginning, we need to encounter Jesus Christ. That, of course, was the one he was persecuting. That was the one he was running from. That was the one that was now speaking into his life. I want you to hear this verse. It won't be in front of you, but it's verse 16. It says, rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. He encountered Jesus. And Jesus was declaring what? Purpose. Right? Jesus was declaring mission. Jesus was declaring new life into Saul. Jesus was declaring spiritual increase into the life of Saul. Jesus was saying to Saul, I have a job for you. I've got mission for you. I've got purpose for you. And he heard those most blessed words that we all need to hear, that we all cherish, that have heard them. I am Jesus, right? I am Jesus. When God speaks and gets a hold of us and we understand who Jesus is, right? You must hear Jesus speak. And of course, it's important to say that means getting along with Jesus. So it's just you and him in prayer and study and waiting and confession and humility. You must hear a word from Jesus. Saul became Paul as he encountered the truth, as he encountered Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Worship team, would you close? You know, let me just say today that as you begin this new year, we're already two weeks in, right? We're already halfway through the first month. You have an opportunity for a new beginning. Do you need one? No? Some do? Many do. It's true that in in our own way, we all kind of kick against the goads, don't we? In our own way, we all need that new beginning that the Lord has for us. Let's stand. And let me say that you have been given a new beginning in Christ. And I pray that as you begin this new year, that you are committed to living out this truth of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, right? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God has called us to receive that into our spirits and to walk and to live in that. Amen. Let's let's worship. There are moments on a journey when following the Lord, when God illumines every step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each other.
let's take a moment and pray. Lord Jesus, we, we hear you knocking. And Lord, we open the doors wide open and we say, come in. Lord, we invite you in today, into our hearts. Lord, take the reins, take the wheel, take our hand. God, we thank you that you have called us. Father, we thank you that you are the God of new beginnings, Lord of hope, of life, of purpose. Lord, that you are speaking into every one of us. Lord, mission. No one is exempt, God. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you today. And, and Lord, we pray that as we begin this new year, uh, Lord, that our gaze would be fixed upon you. Lord, even as Peter, as he got out of the boat, that we would ignore the waves and and the chaos around us and keep our eyes fixed on Christ, you, Lord. And, and Lord, that we would not fear, but that our faith would rise up within us. And Lord, that we would see you, that we would trust you. Lord, you have demonstrated that you are trustworthy. And Lord, we pray that we would take that step of faith to get out of the boat. Lord, to allow you to take our hand and to raise us up and to strengthen us. And Father, today we pray that you would just do a mighty work in our hearts and in our midst. And God, we just, we do thank you for new beginnings, Lord. We thank you, Father, for life. and We thank you for getting into our business and interfering with us and interrupting our path, Lord, that, that we might reflect upon you and what you have and hear your voice. We bless your name and Father, just bless this place in Jesus' mighty name.